Good afternoon, students. We will start our discussion on inter-process communication now. Uh, in earlier classes, we have seen uh, basic concepts related to processes. We began with the concept on the PCB, and we saw a lot of stuff brought in x six code. Then we began discussing life cycle of a process. We saw the different states that a process goes through, like runnable or ready and running and waiting and exited and so on. Then we saw the memory layout of a process in XV6. We saw basic concepts of memory management. We saw how interrupts are handled in general, how interrupts are handled in XV6. We have seen concepts of system call handling in XV6, although we are yet to see them more. Then we have seen the code of scheduler uh, in XV6. Before we begin discussion on IPC, inter-process communication, let us try to understand the need for it. So when we talk of processes on a system, then the processes can be either independent or cooperative. Independent processes are those which run on their own and they don't need uh, to communicate with any other process. The cooperating processes are those which can affect or be affected by other processes, including sharing of data. So we are talking about two or more processes who are willing to do a task in a cooperative fashion. Now, it is possible that the cooperating processes are trying to achieve the same task or they have a part of the task which is shared with, with some other process. Now, let us see some reasons or examples for having cooperating processes. And the first reason is something which all of you have used every other day in your life. Information sharing, like for example, copy paste. I don't know whether you wondered how the copy paste actually works. A, like for example, you are browsing something and you copy a paragraph from that page and you paste it in, let us say a slide or a document. The document software like LibreOffice is a separate process and a browser like Chrome or Firefox is a separate process. How is it possible that the data gets shared between the two processes? There has to be some type of sharing possible and that means there has to be a communication between the processes another example or need for in ipc also comes from the need for speed up of computation for example if you are doing matrix multiplication you know that matrix multiplication is quite expensive um, but the default algorithm is o n q the best you can go get is even more than n square o n square so it's costly. So a better approach of doing this is split the work in multiple processes, let the processes communicate about the result and then get the result. And then some applications want modularity for the sake of convenience or for the sake of efficiency also, for example, Chrome. So in Chrome, you will find that it will have a separate process for displaying the HTML page to you and a separate process for fetching data. So there are variety of needs of IPC and all such cooperating processes need IPC. If we talk of different models of inter-process communication, largely they can be classified into two categories. One is called shared memory and the other is called message passing. Uh, we will see some examples of what is called as <clears throat> shared memory on Linux, message passing on Linux, Podic shared memory, some other some other IPCs like for example pipe which can be classified into one of these two the basic difference between the two approaches shared memory and message passing is this when we talk of shared memory then you have two processes let us say process a and b as shown here and they'll have a region of memory in common right and both of them will be able to access this region of memory now obviously they should have intelligence or rather function or code in them to access this shared memory intelligently you know in a proper way so that they are able to do their work so just having shared memory is not enough they also have to you know have the code to use the shared memory effectively uh, the example of message passing looks like this where process a and b do not have anything in common but basically they request the kernel to send or receive a message 
So the difference between the two approaches is that in message passing, the kernel will have to do more work. In shared memory, the kernel simply makes you available shared memory. In message passing, the kernel also handles the data that one process is sending to another process. For implementing this, the approach is obvious. There are system calls given by the kernel. <laughs> so kernel will give you a system call, for example, uh, to create a shared memory region or to access a shared memory region or to create a message and send it or to receive a message. So the kernel will give system calls to processes for carrying out these tasks. Basically to create the IPC mechanism, either shared memory or message passing, to read or write using IPC mechanism, that is either to send a message or receive a message, etc. And also to delete it because process should normally delete a kernel resource if it's done, it, if it's done using the IPC mechanism. So we have a case here now where processes communicate with each other with the help of OS. And there is no other way they can do it, right? If you want to have a multitasking system where processes are actually segregated into their own address spaces and they should not touch each other's data and code and so on, how will they communicate? They can communicate only with the help of the regulator, that is the kernel. One most typical example of cooperating processes uh, is what is called as producer-consumer problem. This is a problem which is most uh, repeatedly used in the operating system literature to discuss various problems that operating systems face. And uh, it's a very common problem as well. So in this paradigm for cooperating processes, the producer is a process which produces information that is consumed by a consumer process. Now, because the information that is produced needs to be consumed, it has to be stored in between. Now, the approach to storing is basically you have some buffer. Buffer is more like an array, a continuous sequence of bytes. So the, there are two approaches to this. One is unbounded buffer, where the size of the buffer is supposedly practically unlimited. So there is no practical limit on the size of the buffer. The other is a bounded buffer, where the buffer has a fixed size. So producer and consumer will share the buffer between them. This buffer could be shared either as a shared memory or as a message passing or as some other mechanism, but both the producer and consumer will have access to the buffer, the shared buffer. Here is an example. Uh, this is the pseudo code actually. This is not how the code would actually be written for producer consumer, but just to convey you the concept of a producer and consumer, here is the struct item, which is, let us say, the data which is getting shared between the producer and consumer. And there is an array item buffer of size 10. So this is our shared buffer. And this is a bounded buffer because it has a size of 10. Now, there are two variables in and out, which will be used as an index in this buffer by both producer and consumer. So apparently, you know, uh, this is to be used as a queue. And I'm assuming that all of you know implementation of a queue using an array and two indices. So here is a rough pseudo code of the producer. That a producer will first wait till the buffer is non-full. So if the buffer is full, it will wait. Because it cannot write into the buffer if the buffer is full. That is done using this modular arithmetic and the count. When there is a space in the buffer, I simply write an item into the buffer and increment the number of available items by one. The consumer will do the reverse. Consumer will wait until the uh, buffer is empty. Uh, sorry, uh, till the buffer is empty. And once the buffer is non-empty, it will remove an item from the buffer, increment the out variable, which is indicative of uh, one less element in the, in the array. So once again, this was the pseudo code. When you actually write a producer-consumer code using the uh, system-provided system calls, then in fact, uh, even this adding an element will depend on the system call. Like you, you should normally be doing it using the IPC system call to add this particular item. But that is a general idea of producer-consumer problem. Now, have you seen 
an example of programs which are like producer and consumer earlier let me give you a minute to think can you tell me some example of programs which you have seen and they were acting like producer consumer <clears throat> okay my hint is yes you have you have seen so can you try to recollect and uh, think about it like when have you seen cooperating processes that are producer and consumer think about it okay so is a mess mess saying that send and receive in networking in a sense yes uh, when you have a client server program then the client is consumer the server is producer but that is an example of inter process communication between processes over a network can you tell me an example of processes on the same computer processes on the same computer all right there is one more answer and that is correct answer so that is using pipe i have shown you the use of a pipe multiple number of times so for example this you know this what is happening here ls is one process grep is another process output of ls becomes input of grep that is possible in only if the two processes are communicating but in which way ls is producing data which is getting consumed by grep so the moment we start use of this pipe we actually got introduced to the notion of producer and consumer kind of processes what we'll do today is we will see some system calls that are provided by the linux kernel that can be used to actually implement a pipe in a shell all of you have done the assignment on shell but you basically ended up executing a single command let us now try to understand how we can use how we can design a shell with the use with the help of the system call like pipe given by the linux kernel to implement a feature like this now before we go ahead we'll get introduced the concept of pipe first when we talk of pipes for inter process communication remember there are two type of pipes there is a unnamed pipe or ordinary pipe and there is also a named pipe so we will focus largely on the unnamed pipe not on the named pipe but you should know about the named pipe as well so the ordinary pipe or unnamed pipes are used for communication in a standard producer consumer style the producer writes to one end which is called the right end of the pipe and the consumer reads from the other end which is called the read end of the pipe when we say a pipe you can actually uh, uh, bring in front of your eyes a picture of a water pipe now what happens with a water pipe you push water at one end it will come out of the other end so it's like a queue so when we talk of a ordinary pipe it is also a queue where you write at one end and the same data will come out of the other end in fifo fashion in the in the first in first out fashion the ordinary pipes are unidirectional that is you write at one end and then you read from the other end that is how you use the ordinary pipes now a limitation of use of ordinary pipes is this that you cannot use ordinary pipes between any two random processes but you can use them only between processes which are kind of related to each other most typically through a parent child relationship or with some clever is of it between sibling and so on so we will see why this limitation is there when we get introduced to the code of pipe picturally a pipes look like this all right in this picture you will see that uh, this is a pipe which is more like a array or buffer or a memory storage Uh, this is internal to the kernel what the kernel gives to each process and here i have shown a parent and a child process is that it gets a pair of file descriptors a pair of file descriptors and it is using this pair of file descriptors that the communication actually happens so let me explain you now by drawing a diagram what really happens but before that i'll show you some code
point. So this is a very simple program. It is not IPC program. It is a standalone independent program, not IPC program. But we are just getting introduced to the notion of a pipe. So here I have an array of size two PFD, and I'm calling pipe. The moment this pipe system call is called by passing it an argument of PFD, what does the OS internally do? The OS will allocate a buffer, okay, which is internal to the kernel, and it will create a notion of a right end of the buffer and the read end of the buffer. But the read and write end will be made available as two file descriptors. So what do we have here? We have a pipe PFD zero and PFD one. So PFD zero will be filled in with the proper file descriptor number indicating the read end, and PFD one will be filled in by the pipe system call indicating the write end of the pipe. So you can actually do this now. In the write and read system call, you can use PFD one. And PFT zero as the first argument as a file descriptor. So this first write will basically write hello new line into the pipe. The second read will read six bytes here into this str. I am ensuring that str becomes a string by writing null as the seventh byte into it, and then I'm printing this string. I will. I already have a new line here. So in printf, I don't have a new line. So the same process, writing and reading from the pipe. Let us run this code. Okay. Um, a small piece of information you can run make like this, without a make file. If you have a C file called pipe dot C, it will compile it automatically. So fine. Hello, what printed? This happened through the pipe, but this was not a very good example, isn't it? Because in this example, it was the same process. So we should rather do it using two processes, right? Creating a pipe between two processes. Now, before we go ahead, I'll explain to you something. What happens when you call the pipe system call? Ignore this title of this slide. I'm using it as a blank white code. This is a PCB of a process, task struct or stuck proc. Within this, we all know that we have an array of pointers, which is the array of file descriptor pointers. Okay, so this is the array. We know that if let us say I opened a file slash etc password, then one of these is taken and a structure called file struct is constructed, and this is corresponding to the file that I opened. What happens when we Make the pipe system call. When you make the pipe system call, the kernel creates a region of memory. This is, let us say, a buffer. This is a buffer. Now the kernel also creates a kind of struct file and another struct file. This is so. This is, let us say, the a struct file corresponding to read. And this is the struct file corresponding to write of this buffer. So obviously, it will have some position, and this will have some position. You know, like like you have the two indices in an array, and the kernel will make a pointer point here and a pointer point here. So this and this are the two indices that get returned by the pipe system call. This is what has happened when you just called pipe. Now let us say a process had called pipe, and then the process called fork. Then the process called fork. Now what happens in fork? The PCB gets duplicated. So what is the result of the PCB duplication? This, apart from other things, even this array of file descriptors. So now this is the parent process, and this is the child process. But in the child process also. Now, uh, what were the index number here? Zero, one, two, three, four, and five. Zero, one, two, three. So this four will still point here, and this five will still point here. So what is the end result? This buffer is shared between the two. But remember, the buffer is part of the kernel. It is not part of the process's data or local variables. The processes still have access only to the file descriptors. But now the processes can actually use the file descriptors to 
simply call read or write, but it will happen from the buffer. It is the job of the OS to ensure that the read and write happen in a first in first out queue type fashion. The OS will ensure that if you read and write from a file descriptor corresponding to a pipe, the first in first out order will be ensured. So this is what happens when you when you create a pipe and then call fork. Now we'll see another example. Yeah, here is an example. So in this code, I'm calling pipe. This code I'm calling pipe. Then calling fork. All right. Now, the moment this fork was called, remember the pipe is shared between both the child and the parent. What is the child doing? You will notice that the child is doing right into the pipe, PFD1, because that is the right end of the pipe. It is writing hello in the pipe. Before that, it is closing the read end. So remember the fundamental rule of pipes. It is a unidirectional communication mechanism and a process is required to close all unused ends of the pipe. So this process is going to write to the pipe. So it is it should close the read end of the pipe. All right. If you don't do that, your program may behave in a weird fashion. So the child process is writing into the pipe. What is the parent doing? The parent is reading from the pipe. And before that, it is closing the right end of the pipe. Here I am only ensuring that the string becomes a string. It is not an, it doesn't remain an array, it becomes a string. And then I am printing this here. So in this way, we can see that a child is writing into the pipe and the parent is able to read from the pipe. Please don't start imagining how you can implement the LS pipe grape kind of a thing using this because we still have some more things to learn. But let us see this example of a communication using pipe. So compile pipe 2 and running pipe 2. So here it says parent read hello. There is an extra empty line printed because I added it in my printf while this string itself had a new line in it. All right. Any questions on this example of pipe? Any questions on pipe? Sir, uh, in this uh, pipe is called, we can only pass the yes. file description. Please, you are not audible. Just one second. Uh. Let me yeah. also increase. My... Yes, Bulo. Uh, in this uh, uh, system call, we can only pass the file descriptors for the buffer uh, only through the fork. So, uh, only the child or parent process can communicate with each other, right? Right, yes. So, uh, but... Uh, of the unnamed pipe? All, yeah. Uh, also, when the syscall is uh, taking place, uh, uh, how does the new memory, uh, or the shared memory region is uh, allocated or where is it allocated? Your voice is breaking a lot. Can you repeat yourself? Uh, how does the syscall allocate the shared memory region uh, in the pipe uh, for the pipe? See, it is kernel doing it, right? So as of now, we can look at the kernel as a black box. Kernel is managing the entire RAM. The kernel must have reserved some RAM for its own use. And the kernel is utilizing that region of memory to allocate space for the pipe buffer. Does it help you? Uh, also, uh, both the processes will uh, run parallelly. Uh, so that's why we cannot use the pipe as bidirectional, right? Uh, because uh, it could have. Uh, it could happen that one process is uh, reading and at the same time it the first one uh, overrides it and then there will be a uh, clash yeah so the thing is that there is no guarantee in which the two processes uh, the order in which the two processes will run 
and there is no guarantee when somebody will call read and somebody will call write and that is why the pipe is to be used unidirectionally so you are right okay in whatever you were saying right any other question okay now i'll go further uh, and i'll try to give you uh, a good enough picture of how you can use uh, this pipe system call to actually you know do something like this okay not head but if i say grep to do something like this you know to actually implement a pipe in your own shell code before we do that let us begin with some very basic concepts if you remember i had told you that there are three file descriptors which are already open 0 1 and 2 even if you have not done anything with it so the system makes them open now look at this code in this code i am calling the read system call on descriptor 0 which is already open and i am reading into this array buffer 5 bytes and then i am simply printing them using putcat let us just, you know, this, this code is written to convince you that read zero will read from the keyboard. So let me compile this and run this and I'll say a widget and uh, you will see that the five characters were read, A, B, H, I, J and uh, they got printed. The rest of it actually became as an input to the shell and it failed because the, my program was trying to read only five bytes. So read zero, read from file descriptor zero, will actually read from keyboard. Similar here is an example of write to one. So here I am writing to the file descriptor one, saying hello. And I am also writing to the file descriptor two, which is supposed to be the standard error uh, device. These two are different, they are not the same. But it so happens that both of them map to the screen ultimately. So all the output comes on screen, but remember, there are two different streams of output and they work independently of each other, although both of them come on screen. So on screen, I should see hello, bye and hi, but it may come out of order because this stream is independent of this stream of output. So right to the one will actually end up on the screen. So let us run this. So hello, bye, and hi, and what was the order we had? Hello, bye, and hi, but uh, I'll also have um, error one here, error two here, I'll say out one and out two. Okay, so out one, error one, out two, error two, that is the order we expect. Now, now you will see that the output came like this, out one, error one, out error two, so this two did not come, this two of the output. Um, and the new line also did not come in some instances. Let us run it again. Yeah. So what you will see is that all the output is actually not, not shown on the screen, right? Particularly the, the two of the output and the new line never came on the screen. What did I do? Dot. So the, the point to be understood here is that this stream of output writing to standard output one and standard output two, uh, standard output two, they are two different streams. There is no guarantee in which order they will actually come on the screen because remember one very important thing, all the writes are normally delayed by the kernel. So what happens, you call the write system call, the kernel will note it down that the write has to be done. Your function call system call will return. The kernel will do the write at its own convenience. And I'm talking about all the reads and all the writes. Okay, so this is called delayed write. Kernel often does a delayed write. And uh, that is why like now you can relate to it because sometimes you might have observed that when you got a sec fault, the sec fault was on the next line but the printing on earlier line did not happen. That is because the printing was delayed, because the write system call itself was delayed. And most typically all writes are delayed by the kernel. It does the writing at its own convenience. 
So your set fault comes first and the write has not happened. And similarly here, the program gets over much before these writes could happen. So, but I made my point that the write one and write two will actually write to the screen. Now I'm going to do something interesting. And uh, where is my program? Okay, I don't see it here. Pipe, pipe, read zero. Okay, here is a program. So the, in this program, first I'm calling close of zero. So although you don't open a file for file descriptor zero, it's already open, you can close it. This is saying I'm, I'm going to close my standard input. If you just do this and do a scan, if your scanning won't work, okay, for sure. But then an interesting thing is being done a file is being opened for reading. The question is, what is the return value of this open? Which file descriptor will you get? The answer is guaranteed to be zero. Because open will try to locate the first empty slot in the file descriptor array. I just now guaranteed that the first empty slot is zero. So this open is actually going to return file descriptor of zero. Right. That is why now what will happen this scanf, which basically does a read from file descriptor 0, will now read from the file, whichever file I opened. It will read from the file, it will not read from the keyboard because the code of scanf remains the same. The code of scanf remains read from file descriptor 0. What I did here is I changed the meaning of the file descriptor 0 with a simple clever trick of closing 0 and then opening the file. So this scanf will actually open, will actually uh, not open, it will read from the file and not from the keyboard. So let's verify that. Make read zero scanf. Okay, now I need to give it a file and have some data in the file. So what was I reading? I was reading a string, right? So I will open a file, um, uh, KKK and here I write a widget. Now I'll run my program and give it the argument of this file. It read from the file. The scanf read from the file. Now to convince you about this, what I'll also do, um, let me write a hello world.c and in this I'll um, integer okay, character buff and I'll do a scanf and I'll do a printf. All right. Let's not have a header file. Okay, let us have the header file. So simple program, scanf and printf, make hello world. What I'll do, I'll use stress on this. Those of you who don't know stress, you have not done the lab task of the last week. All right, if you have done the lab task of the last week, you'll know stress. So I'm running now stress. It's going to show me all the system calls that are going to happen. So all I have is a scanf and printf. So it is waiting in read zero. So scanf is basically calling read zero. Now I type a widget. And uh, this is what I type. But after reading the data, it called write one. So this is what printf and scanf are doing internally, read zero and write one. That is why in this code, read zero dot scanf, sorry, read zero dot, read zero scanf dot c. When I did this, I effectively achieved now what is called as redirection of standard input. Similarly, I can do this now. CP this, I'm copying this to save typing time. All right, so I'm closing one here. I'm opening a file and creating it if needed. And I'm going to give it some permissions. Now what will happen? I'm closing one, then opening a file. So this file, is guaranteed to be located at file descriptor one. 
and I'm simply going to do this printing of okay, let me print a widget. Fine. Where will this widget go? It will go in the file. It will not come on the screen. This will not come on the screen. It will actually go to the file. Let's verify that. Make right one printf. All right, man to open these three header files as included, fine. S underscore I S. Okay. That is a typing mistake actually. And I think I have already added these three files. I should have said IR user. Compiled. Now run this. Okay, I have to give it a file name, right? So I'll say new. Nothing came on screen. I, I did a printer, but nothing came on screen. And let me do a cat on this file. This file gets the string of widget new line. So what I did is a is called as a redirection of standard output. This is what your shell does when you do this. When I executed this command with the right arrow after ls and the file name after that, the output of ls did not come on screen, it went to this file. So what did my shell do? What did my shell do? In my shell did simply this. It created a child by calling fork. But in the code of child, before exec, in the code of child, before exec, it simply closed one and opened that file. That is why the output of ls went to this file. So let us go here. Okay. CP shell, where is my shell? Output reader okay. shell reader.c shell reader.c. So this was the shell we wrote in the class, right? So all my shell is right now doing is this. After it creates a child process, this is the code. You close one, you open whatever is the file name, and you give it these arguments. Fine. So some more work has to be done here, like string processing after you read the command and extracting the right arrow and extracting the file name. So you get the file name and you open that file. Then you call exec. So remember, when you call exec, right, even after you call exec, the file descriptors get carried along. After you call exec, the file descriptors will get carried. That is why the standard output of the newly created process, exec process, not newly created process, the exit process will actually keep redirecting the output to this file. This is how the output redirection is achieved via shell. Okay, and we just now saw an example of that. Okay, let me remove this file because I have not actually created it. But I, I am sure I have conveyed the meaning of output redirection and input redirection. Similarly, you know, you can also do this. Okay. This is called input redirection. So the command can actually read from the file. So this also works. Remember, there's a difference between saying this and saying this. Although the output is same. If you say cat etc password, file will be shown. If you say this, the file will be shown. But there is a difference. There is a difference in these two. Fine. There is a difference in what the shell did before it executed cat. So that was standard input and output redirection. But what do we really want to do? Right? What do we really want to do? If I want to do a pipe like this, in this I want to actually redirect the output of ls as the input of head minus 1. The output of ls as the input of head minus 1. What we said just now is how to redirect the standard output to a file and standard input from a file. What we want to do is output standard uh, redirect standard output to a pipe and redirect standard input from a pipe. How to do that? To do that, the system call that comes handy is called dupe. So dupe is a system call which duplicates a file descriptor. So here you pass a existing file descriptor and the kernel will do the job like open. It will find the next available file descriptor. Copy the pointer 
and return the index. So basically, you have two file descriptors pointing to the same file as a result of do. So essentially, what is happening inside kernel code? Copy of a pointer. That's it. You are copying a pointer, and you are returning the index of the new pointer. The dupe two uh, is slightly advanced. It takes both old FD and new FD, and it actually makes this pointer same as this pointer. So you index into the file descriptor array using this index. Whichever is the pointer here will be the same as this point, the pointer given by old FD. So that is the difference between dupe and dupe two. So now what do we really need to do here is this. Do I have it? Yeah. So I'm going to show you now uh, this. So I just now executed a command with a pipe using my bash shell. I'm going to show you a program which does have the same effect as this, but a program which is not a shell. Okay, a program which is not a shell. So here, in fact, I don't know why I still have the while loop here. I could actually remove the while loop. This is the program. So here I call a pipe. Which pipe? What happens? OS creates the buffer. It sends me two file descriptors: one for reading, one for writing. PFD zero for reading, PFD one for writing. I'm printing it also. What are the values we expect here for PFD zero and PFD one? Three and four, because zero and two are already open. So PFD zero should be three and PFD one should be four. That is common sense, right? Because you you always get the file descriptors, descriptors in the increasing order. Then calling fork. So when I call fork, the pipe is shared between child and parent. Now see what is the child doing? Child is closing zero and then duping PFD zero. What it is saying? Duplicate the file descriptor given by the read end of the pipe. Now in which index will it get duplicated? Obviously in zero because I have closed zero just now, and that is the first available file descriptor. So zero becomes PFD zero. The pointer at index zero becomes the same as the pointer at PFD zero. I'm closing PFD one because I'm not going to write to the pipe, and this will exit the second command that is head. Then in the parent process, closing one, duplicating PFD one. So whatever was PFD one becomes my standard output now. Closing PFD zero because I am not going to use it. This will exit cat. So the effect of this command is this: that one process becomes cat, other process becomes head. The cat process is going to do a standard output, just like it was doing earlier. But I have ensured that the standard output goes to the pipe. The head process is going to work exactly the same as it was working earlier. I have not changed head or cat at all. The head is going to wait for input from the standard input, but I have ensured here that the standard input is going to come from the pipe, and the kernel has ensured that the output and input of the pipe get connected. So this is how you end up implementing something like one process communicating with another process. So let me compile this cat pipe head. We have achieved here. A consumer producer problem, a solution to the producer consumer problem. So three, four. Okay, these are the expected file descriptors, and this is the first two line output. So this is how we achieved uh, use of a pipe to make two different processes talk to each other. Um, questions on this? Any questions? I'll wait for half a minute to take any questions. Can you wait for ten minutes? Okay. Good. No questions. So let me go ahead. Do I have any other program? What is this program? All right. In this program, I have done a slightly different work. Um, 
once again i have a while loop i don't know why i still have a while loop but uh, here what is happening is that a pipe is created by the parent then parent is calling fork what is the child doing child is running head by duplicating standard input then the parent is again calling fork and the second child is running cat so now see what is happening here the pipe was created by the parent and if the parent does a fork twice both the children will have access to the pipe so one child is running cat the other child is running head the parent is simply not using the pipe okay so this will still have the same effect but the parent exist okay in my earlier code the parent was overwritten by cat so if you want to do a pipe using the shell this is the approach you would be taking not the earlier approach wherein the parent that is shell creates a pipe then the shell creates two processes and the two processes will exec the two different parts of the pipe command and they will be able to communicate all right so let me run this command uh, let me run this program and let me ignore these warnings but you will notice that the output is same all right so these are the two lines of output that i expected to see what is the zero zero here i don't know what is this zero okay i'm printing the five descriptors but i'm printing them before i called pipe that is why they came out to be zero which is fine we'll ignore that so one of the important things that you'll be doing is now you can try to improve your shell to have output redirection input redirection and a pipe but a pipe between multiple processes so you should be able to do something like this okay you should be able to do something like this no as many pipes as desired maybe 10 15 pipes now remember few things about the pipe though all right remember few things about pipe a pipe is not like redirection to a file by by a single process when you are running a simple command like say let us say this both cat and head are processes that exist at the same time it is not it is not that the cat will write the entire output to pipe and then the head will read it no cat is continuously writing to the pipe and head is continuously reading from the pipe that that is that should be clear that is why if you want to connect multiple processes like this you cannot use a single system call called pipe if you have one bar here one vertical bar here one vertical bar here that means you have to call the pipe system call three times by passing it different array every time all right and then connect all these processes together if you want to have a shell which can handle multiple number of pipes so that is very important for you to know so with this we stop the discussion on pipes and the unnamed pipes and we move to named pipes named pipes are also called fifo although the unnamed pipes are also fifo but it is a name pipes which get called as fifo so processes can create actually a file and a file that acts as a pipe and because it's a file if you know the name of the file any process can use that file to do a read and write because it is a file so all you have to all you have to know is the name of the file these are obviously more powerful than ordinary pipes because any process can use a named pipe for unnamed pipes you need a relationship among the processes and the communication that is why can be bidirectional but of course if multiple processes are reading and writing at the same time they have to do some other solution to figure out who wrote and who read and whether it was right or not that is the bothering of the processes the name pipe itself will not have anything like that so right now we don't need any parent child relationship for communication and several processes can use the name pipe for communication this is available on both unix and windows and uh, always will not automatically delete it it has to be deleted like a normal file you can just use rm to delete a named pipe so the system call to create a named pipe on linux is mkfifo 
and obviously you have to give a path name to it and some file permissions to be given on this file. Now let us see an example. Do I have an example? Okay, I don't have an example here. MKFIFO. Okay, but what I know is there is a command called MKFIFO. So MKFIFO is nothing but a wrapper on top of the MKFIFO system call. That's it. So I'll say MKFIFO slash TMP slash XYZ123. It has created now a named pipe called XYZ123. So let me do a ls on that. Yeah, see there is a file. Okay. The interesting thing about the file is the size is zero. And if you look at the permissions, there is a P in the beginning. Normally there is a hyphen in the beginning, right? So if I do ls minus lt on this, you will see the, the normal thing is to have a hyphen. Hyphen means it's a regular file, but this file tmp x is not a regular file, it's a named pipe. So there is a P in the beginning. So it's a special type file. Kernel knows it's a special type file, okay? It's a FIFO file. And now, because the file is there, uh, you can do this, equal high to this. And this is a blocking write. So the write, so the data is, has gone into the pipe, but it has to be read now. So I will try to read it from the pipe. So this cat actually read from the pipe and it got the high and this process is also over now. Right. So multiple processes could be reading and writing from the pipe, but then they will have to figure out whose data they have read and what data they have read, they'll have to do, do that job. So you could also write a simple C program which opens a named pipe using MKC4, then writes to it, then reads from it. Let me, let me see, I think I have somewhere a uh, No, not this. Give me a minute. I'll figure it out. I have a program somewhere here. Okay. Yep, I have. Okay, so this is a program which simply calls MKV4. Uh, passing it a file name and giving some permissions on it and uh, then you open the file for writing and then you write to the file. This is how you, this is how you use a named pipe. Okay. This is how we use a named pipe. That was an example of named pipe. Do I have any other example also? Okay. Ah, I have it here. Huh, I remember this. This is the interesting code. This is a program 1.c. And uh, this is the file name for my pipe. You call the mk fifo So it will create this file with these permissions. Then there is a loop. The loop is opening the file for reading first. Then reading from the file. Reading from the standard input actually. So I will type something. It will write to the named pipe now and then close the named pipe. Then it will open the named pipe for reading, will read from the pipe and print it. What is the other program doing? The other program is quite similar. It uh, creates a pipe if it doesn't exist. Now it is first opening the pipe, reading from the pipe and printing it. And then it is opening the file for writing and getting the input and writing that input in the pipe. So this is a chat, chat program. Well, this is already compiled. So I'll run program one here. And I'll write program two here. So I'll say hello here. And uh, it says user two says hello. And I'll say good morning. And he says user two. One says good morning. And like this. So this is a chat program. All right. So with a name to pipe, you could do this. Although what I want you people to really focus on is the unnamed pipe. Okay, there's a question in the chat. Can't we use open instead of dupe? To open, you have to specify a file name. If you want to use open, 
You have to specify a file name. You cannot identify an unnamed pipe using a file name because it is not a file. And unnamed pipe is not a file. It is a it is essentially represented by an internal data structure in the kernel. So what is the argument you will give to open? The do simply copies a pointer. So it's a nice way of doing things. Did I answer your question, Karthik? Okay, with a named pipe, you can do that. If you are using a named pipe, because a named pipe has a name, that is a file name, you could use it, uh, like you could close one and then open. So like a redirection, you could do that with a named pipe, but with not an unnamed pipe. With unnamed pipe, you'll have to stick to do. All right, so we will stop our discussion on pipes. And tomorrow we'll start with shared memory. Any quick question? Sir, how the uh, end of the input is marked in the pipe? Like uh, the second process doesn't know if the first process is uh, completed with the IO or not, or and it doesn't know when to stop reading input from the pipe. Okay, your question is how will the system call read and write know that the data is over, correct? Uh, yes. So it is the job of the operating system code to ensure that when the data is over, the read and write should return. Okay, but uh, in normal, uh, normally giving the input, we pass control D like uh, end of file minus one. But yeah. uh, in case of the pipe, uh, the second, suppose the LS and grep consider, so LS has completed the, it is the job uh, of the OS to detect. It is the job of the OS to detect that the queue became empty. So it is as good as the so-called end of file. Okay. Okay. So-called end of file because there is there is end of file is just a notion, right? That there is no more data to read. So the OS kernel because it is maintaining the pipe buffer and it is maintaining maybe some indexes into the buffer to know where to read and where to write in the buffer. But it can also detect that the buffer has become empty and there is no more data. But sir, uh, consider the case that the WC is piped to the cat and WC is waiting for the input from the user. So in this case, there WC is WC no... is word count, right? Yes, word count. Yeah. So, so, in so this like this, case, uh, WC, WC piped to cat. So in this case, the WC will wait. Uh, but the queue will always be empty until and unless we have typed and uh, completed our IO. Yeah, correct. So that is basically a characterization of the working of WC, that it is not writing anything to the unnamed pipe until it has done its work. So that is a characteristic of WC, not the pipe. So I'm typing something and you know, WC is still reading my data. So that is WC, right? When I now press control D, WC will know that the input has ended. It will do its work. Now it will do a printf of these three numbers and that will go to cat. And cat will okay. simply read, read and write this. Okay, so, but uh, while wait, WC is waiting for the input, the cat is also trying to read the queue, right? Correct. The cat is also but, waiting in read, read zero. But cat, both WC for, and cat are waiting in read zero. Okay. But for the cat, the queue is empty. Right. Correct. But the queue is empty. Uh, yes, go ahead. So that can mean that the, either the uh, it program is over or program is yet to write to the pipe. So, so I think you're asking me a question, which is an already answered question uh, from the perspective of data structures, right? So uh, uh, you have a queue and you have to tell me whether the queue is full or empty. And you also have to tell me that the queue became empty after reading from the queue. It is always possible to write code, which tells me these three different conditions, right? Yeah, yeah, got it. So 
Yeah, the kernel simply has to take care of that, right? Yes. Whether you are waiting because there was no data or because now you have read the data, these are two different conditions. The, you can always write a code to differentiate between these two conditions. Yes, yes, got it. So I hope uh, at least now many of you appreciate the utility of a queue. <laughs> queue is so essential to making the kernel work, you know, because kernel has to give you a pipe. And it is basically a queue data structure. Right. right. So let's stop now. I will see you tomorrow.